Welcome to another edition of uh, Secondhand Summer, being read by me, Dan Walker, the author. Secondhand Summer is uh, coming to the climax as we are waiting to find out what terrible thing has happened in Sam Barger's life. So let's jump right into chapter 14. Alarms went off in my brain and I automatically started searching for lies. I immediately went back to the day Dad had his first heart attack, but he was already dead. He couldn't die twice. So this had to be about me. What's the matter, I mumbled, trying to think straight. Mom sat on the edge of the bed. It's about your friend Billy. The alarms went off again. Billy, he's dead, dying, dead, died. His grandmother just called, she continued. He didn't come home tonight, and she's worried sick. She called all the Bargers on Government Hill looking for you. Do you know where he is? What? Uh, no. Where was a lie when I needed it? What time is it? Three in the morning. Mom must have been worried big time to wake me up in the middle of the night. I had learned that much in my short life. Every mom thinks every kid is her kid. What happens to one kid happens to all of us, even if that kid is a total stranger. I wasn't the one missing but it didn't make any difference to her. For once, I told her most everything. I told about riding in Mr. Martin's Corvette without her permission. I told her about places Billy and I usually rode our bikes. I told her about the gully where we built our lean-to and about sneaking into the railroad yard. I told her a lot, but I didn't tell her everything. She didn't need to know about the Caribou Club, not yet. After I cleared my conscience, she left and I tried to go back to sleep, but it was impossible. My brain imagined all that might have happened to Billy. The next day, there were police to talk to. Instead of talking at home, they took me to the police station downtown. At first, it was cool, riding in a police car, but then I started to worry about all the laws that I had probably broken that summer. Did they know somehow? I was glad when Joe drove across town to check on me and be at my side during the interview. He even gave me a hug. A serious and nervous young cop, about Joe's age, took me into an office and gave me a Coke. He asked my full name and age, and then looked at the tabletop and asked, what about this Mr. Martin? Did he touch you? Did he give you presents? What? I'm sorry, kid. I understand that you boys were at the home of Billy's neighbor, Mr. Martin, and that he gave you all rides in his car. Yes, he did. So? And these car rides, were you alone with him, one at a time? Is that right? Well, it's a Corvette Stingray. It's only a two-seater, sir. So what? So did Mr. Martin touch you or say anything he shouldn't have? You know. The cop looked hopeless, helplessly at Joe, as if he could explain it to me. But this thing he was hitting, hinting at was too beyond me. I couldn't understand. I shook my head. It wasn't like that. Mr. Martin was just a friendly guy with a cool car. It was nice of him to give us rides. That's all I know. And that's all I wanted to know. Why are you asking about Mr. Martin, I asked. He's a friend of Billy's. He's a neighbor. You should be looking for Billy. Something must have happened to him. Something had to have happened, right? I just can't figure out what. I had to tell my story over and over again until the emotion of my missing friend was worn away in the telling. Like a bad joke, it wasn't funny the second time around. In the end, I was left with just my confusion and Taylor and Masick as my only friends. On the way home from the police station, I tried to imagine where Billy could be, but it was beyond me. I replayed the events of the evening looking for the answers to everybody's questions. The cops seemed to think Mr. Martin was the answer to their question, and I have to admit that Slick was sort of weird. What kind of guy would give rides to neighborhood kids instead of cruising for beautiful women in that rolling chick magnet of a Corvette? Maybe I had it wrong. And worse, maybe Billy was gone for good. Maybe. A Corvette pulled up beside us at the stop site, stoplight, and I felt my stomach coil in a tight twist. I couldn't look at the driver, and I hated that car that Billy could have loved. And as the car moved away from us down a side street, 
I remembered Billy rising from the ground with his arms outstretched that time we saw the vet go by. For the second night in the row, I hardly slept. Why didn't we go to the movie that day instead of Mr. Merton's? If only. The next morning I called Masick. You talked to the cops? Yeah, me and Taylor both. Did you tell them about the Caribou Club? No way, I'm not a fink. I didn't trust him anymore. What did you tell them then? They asked me a ton of questions. Come on, man. Uh, nothing, really nothing. Uh, just a bunch of made up stuff. You didn't tell them about the fort or the water balloons? You didn't tell them about riding in Mr. Martin's vet? Well, yeah, I had to tell him that. That guy was a weirdo. My dad says he's got a record or something. We told the cops how Billy was hanging around his place last time we saw him. Whose place? Martin's place. I'm sure he's got Billy. My dad says anybody that's nice to kids like us is probably a pervert. I couldn't believe my ears, so I just hung up the phone and stared at the wall. With Masick telling the cops things like that, no wonder they were all over Mr. Martin. No wonder they thought the worst. Once again, I started doubting myself. Was it possible? Could Mr. Martin have kidnapped Billy? He seemed like a nice guy. But then people always said stuff about psychos, don't they? If it wasn't for Mr. Martin, then if it wasn't Mr. Martin, then where was Billy? The wheels in my brain started turning again once I quit doubting myself. I was pretty sure something made Billy run away from home, and that meant one thing. I knew where he was. I was supposed to stay home where Mary could keep an eye on me. Since Billy had gone missing, Mom didn't want me out of her sight. But I had to get out of there. I had to take some action. And I figure I had enough dope on Mary to make her cover for me. I was halfway down the front stairs when she saw me leaving. You little sneak, get back up here. If you so much as look out that front door, Mom will have us both sent to the salt mines. Mary was at her tough motherly best. I'm not getting grounded just because you and your stupid friends can't stay out of trouble. Ignoring her, I jumped on my bike and rode standing up most of the way to the Caribou Club. We never approached the club directly and always left the brush along the street undisturbed. But this time, I crashed on through and entered from the street side of the club, not caring if someone might see me. With all the police interrogations and worried parents, I hadn't spoken one word about the club. It wasn't on purpose, at least on my part, just no one had thought of it. Maybe hiding and lying were becoming second nature. Billy could be there. I couldn't figure out why or what might have happened to him, but that was where he would be if he had run off. I knew it. I was so sure that I stopped and bought him an Almond Joy on my way. When I got to the club, the padlock was still in place and locked. That wasn't good. I had given Billy a key, but he wouldn't have been able to lock it again from the inside. Then I remembered the broken window we escaped through when the cop locked the door on us. I ran around the building, but the broken window was covered from the outside with a scrap like we'd left it. I walked care fearfully around the building and peeked in all the dirty windows. No sign of Billy. I gave up and walked home. Wait up, Barger! Taylor and Masick were trudging up the road from the other direction. They broke into a run when they saw me. Wait up, Barger! Taylor called again. What happened to you? I stopped and tried to look casual, but I had a sour taste in my mouth. What do you want? Whoa, man, said Masick. What's your problem? After you asked if we talked to the cops about the club, it hit me. Yeah, Taylor added. We split it as soon as we could get away. Maybe Billy went there to hide out from something. Forget it. I was just there. Billy's not at the club. Now just leave me alone. And I started walking toward home again. Wait up, Masick said. You went to the club alone? Yeah, what of it? I kept walking, talking over my shoulder, pushing my bicycle. And besides, I thought you said Mr. Martin had done Billy in. We just said that stuff about Martin to keep the cops off our backs, Taylor answered. Well, that's just great, I sneered. Look, I don't know what happened, but you shouldn't have lied about Mr. Martin. He was nice to us. A 
A flicker of something passed over our faces, their faces, guilt, doubt. Then Masick said, man, Taylor, you shouldn't have lied. Oh yeah, Masick, I'm the one who lied, Taylor countered, and you were Mr. Honesty? As I walked away, Masick called to me, hey Sam, wait a minute, you wanna go spy on the cops searching the gully? Taylor pleaded, hey Sam, come on, I'm sorry. Yeah, double for me, Masick added. I was lonely, I missed Billy, and another time I might have been tempted to join them just for the company, like I had two months ago. Instead, I just kept my mouth shut and kept moving. Chapter 15. The next day, there was still no news of Billy. The cops had all called his grandma and she had called mom to keep her in the know. The search had started in Billy's backyard and spread through the alley to the abandoned Quonset hut and then onto the gully. All our neighborhood haunts. Apparently, there were some questions about a camp they found there. And after I told mom it was ours, she wanted to keep me close in case the police had more questions. She made a deal with me to clean and repair the storage unit in the basement so I could make money for school clothes. Her orders were clear. Stay close to home and don't leave without permission. I spent the whole morning tacking up chicken wire on the beat up storage compartments that lined up like prison cells along the one wall of the basement. They were all framed in wood and covered with chicken wire. Some were without doors, others had part of the chicken wire pulled away, and my job was to fix the wire and screw the doors back on. Then I had to sweep and haul out any trash. In the quiet of the musty basement, I sat among boxes of old canning jars and daydreamed of being anywhere else. My mind wandered back to Billy. Billy in the spotlight, singing, I want to hold your hand. Billy leaping bumps on his bike along the bluff, his straight black hair bouncing. Billy, who didn't know how to whistle. I tried to push everything that wasn't pretend out of my mind because I didn't want the real world in my head right then. But the real world wouldn't stay out, and soon I was stewing on Billy. I missed him, and rather than bring me closer to Taylor and Masick, it made me see their shortcomings even more clearly. Masick and Taylor had fear on their minds, fear that it could have been one of them gone missing. It could have been one of them that people would forget even before they knew them. I had enough fear. I didn't need theirs. When I was replacing the light bulb in our storage unit, I suddenly felt like turning loose all my anger and hurt. And I was standing on a chair and I dropped the bulb. It exploded with a loud pop, and I remember how Taylor had thrown the light bulbs in the club. Something snapped, and I went out in the hallway and unscrewed two more light bulbs and stood in their dear darkness with them still hot against my hands, and I ran the length of the hall, throwing the bulbs over my shoulder one at a time. They exploded like grenades, and I wanted to do more, but I stopped and stared at the shattered glass. This wasn't me. I didn't want to be like Masick and Taylor. I swept up the mess. Even that distraction of working in the basement didn't last long, and my mind went back to Billy. I remember the first time I'd seen him riding his banana seat bike, and then I remembered something else. I had ridden past his day by house the day before, and his bike wasn't in the carport. It was always parked there, not in the backyard, not in the front yard, always up in the carport. Yet it wasn't there. And if it wasn't there, he had ridden it somewhere. And he hadn't been on his bike when he went to Mr. Martin's house. He had parked it in the carport and walked over. I had seen fresh bike tracks in the mud behind the Caribou Club. Billy had been there. I had to go back. I charged up the stairs to the apartment, grabbed some money in the padlock key, and headed for the door. My hand was on the doorknob when Mom barreled in. You're home early, I nearly shouted. Mom reached out and took a hold of me like it might be the last time we got to hug. Sam, sweetie, she said, and I could tell she was about to cry. I had to come home and tell you in person. I couldn't do it over the phone. Billy's grandma finally told me the whole story. Billy's dad was killed in Vietnam last week. He was a soldier, you know. 
Billy's been carrying that around inside him for days before he disappeared. And now he's gone too. Oh, that poor dear lady. I felt like I was falling backward in time. I could taste the sea air. I could smell the salmon from my last day on the bluff. I could see the dust of the car as it tore out of the yard with the last of my dad in it. You might be right about that boy, Sam. Maybe he did run away. Billy might just be out there somewhere lost and hiding, and you might be the best bet of finding him. I was halfway out the door when she stopped me long enough to stuff some cookies in a paper sack and press it in my hand. A half hour later, I stood alone inside the Caribou Club and no ambush of cops awaited me, just the quiet darkness. Our kingdom was intact. And even with the door padlocked, I was positive that Billy had found a way to get in. I could just feel it. He wasn't dead and he wasn't kidnapped. He was right there in our hangout somewhere. I turned on the lights I could and I called softly. Billy, hey, Billy, man, you here? I roamed through the building and saw and heard nothing. No sign that anyone had been there. Maybe my gut was wrong. I called again as I walked toward the back door, and there I paused. A sound, a tiny rattle, almost not a sound at all, came from over my left shoulder. I froze. Then I heard it again from inside the closet where we hid from the cops. I jerked open the door and jammed my flashlight into the darkness. And in the center mound of paper and cardboard was a shoe, a single sneaker sticking out of the trash. Billy, is that you? My voice was soft, but it still echoed in the hallway. The shoe moved and then another emerged and then jeans and an arm. And then Billy Anderson, my best friend, rolled out of the pile of old paper. He shrunk back from me with his arms up as if I might hit him. Billy, my yell echoed through the empty building. Sam, it was all he said. And then he came to me and we hugged shamelessly. He began to cry. I knew it, I lied. I knew you'd be here. Where have you been, he asked. What took you so long? Well, what do you mean? Why didn't you holler? Didn't you hear me calling you? I must have been asleep. But why didn't you come sooner? What well, is what I mean. I've been waiting. This time I cried a little and smiled at my friend. The friend I'd given up on. The friend I'd let the rest of the world take away from me. I thought, well, they said Mr. Martin did something bad to you. What? He was confused and shaken. What do you mean, Sam? Who thought what? So we sat down and I told him the whole story. How the police and everybody were thinking he had been kidnapped or something. I told him how Mr. Martin was a suspect. I told him how I'd already come here once before. And then he stopped me. You came here looking for me already? Yeah, yesterday. I came and looked all around the outside, but the lock was still on the door and everything looked tight as we left it. I didn't think you'd been here. Well, I didn't want to be found. Well, not at first, he explained. And I thought you'd look here right away. So I got in and I hid the bike inside. Then I pried open another window and went back out to lock the lock. I got back in the same window a couple of times. You've been coming and going? Well, yeah, yesterday when you were here, I was probably down at the railroad yard. Remember that day when we were there, you and that railroad cop? He started laughing. I had to laugh too, but I wanted to scream. Well, what were you doing down there in the railroad yard? I was going to jump a train and get out of town, but there weren't no trains and I couldn't find a way to do it. So I just came back home and waited for you. I knew you'd come. Well, it's a good thing for Mr. Martin you didn't get on that train. They would have arrested him for sure. Well, that doesn't make any sense. The cops arresting Mr. Martin, he didn't do anything. He's just a goofy old guy with a greasy haircut. A nice goofy old guy with greasy hair. What a bummer. He shook his head and then changed the subject. You got any food? I haven't eaten nothing but candy bars out of the machine at the gas station for days now. Oh, gosh, food. I took out the cookies and offered them. So, what? Did you run away? What's the matter? Billy was quiet, wolfing down a cookie. The shadow of the caribou club surrounded us, and I felt chilly. I wanted sunlight. 
Billy stood and walked out into the ballroom, so I got up and followed him, flipping on the stage lights to make things brighter. He turned and looked at me, and looked me right in the eye. My dad, he's dead now, like yours. But how? I let him tell it like I didn't know. For some reason, I wanted him to feel like this was fresh to me. Billy walked to the bandstand and hoisted himself up. He seemed unsteady and weak, like he might fall over. I waited. I knew it was his say. I lost my dad. He was in the army, right? That's right. And he was in Vietnam, and they killed him. Oh, Billy. The heat rose in me like I hadn't heard the news at all. Him saying it made it real now. God damn it, I yelled. And we sat there staring into the shadows around the stage. Sam, it's already like he never was at all. Don't say that, Billy. You just got to hold on to the things you remember. I like to remember this one night I spent with my dad at the beach. He was blowing smoke rings for me. And he let me drink some of his coffee. And it was sweet and creamy. And he blew a smoke ring that rose right past me. And it spread wide, getting bigger and bigger. And then it bent until the ring was broken. And there was only a whisk. I stopped talking and just sat there remembering. Smoke rings are like our lives, I continued. They start out all tight and perfect and then they roll and grow and you can't stop them and you can't control them. And sometimes they get thin and twisted until there aren't rings anymore. Then they're gone. It was a while before Billy said anything. Seems like everything is so dark now. I shook my head trying to shake off the dark mood. And it stinks, Billy, it does, but it gets better, slowly. Your smoke ring ain't broken yet. It was quiet again for a time as I waited for him to say what was in his head. I gotta go live with my mom now, and she's all messed up. That's why I ran away. You don't have to run. You could have told me. I could have helped. But it doesn't matter, man, you're alive. And that's good enough for me. Alive, living, live. I could feel warmth coming into me. They want to send me to Oregon, to my mom, but I don't want to live with somebody who hated my dad. I want to stay here. I know it feels right, but running ain't going to work. Trust me. I heard myself say it like I was a grown-up or something. You're still a kid. You're stuck. I know, he said. What's it like for you being without a dad? Oh, I don't know. Kind of weird, I guess. It messes things up. You know, it's like he's just not there and you feel like he's looking over your shoulder all the same. It changes everything. When I was little one time, I couldn't sleep. And lots of times when I can't sleep, I make up stories. And you know, I'd pretend I was someone else living a different life. And one time, I don't know why, I imagined both my parents died and left me an orphan. And it was so real that night that it made me cry. I was actually choking up pretty good telling that story. And then, you know, when my dad actually died and I really was an orphan, I didn't cry at all. Billy chuckled. Yeah, I was mad because my mom didn't want me to live with her, so I had to come live with grandma. And now mom wants me to come live with her, but I don't want to. It was like all this was just too much. I just had to get the hell out of there. And you've been hanging out here all this time. What else could I do? The morning in the railroad yard when I planned to jump a train, I thought to myself, then what, Billy Anderson? You gonna go to Fairbanks? What are you gonna do in Fairbanks with a pocket full of nothing? I realized Billy must be pretty hungry. Those cookies probably only got his motor running. I got a couple bucks, I said. You want a hamburger or something? Billy's eyes lit up. Would I ever? Well, let's go. I'm buying. No, thanks, man. I'm cool. I want to stay just right here. I let things be the way he wanted. That was all good. Be right back, I said. And I was halfway out the door when I turned and asked, Will you think about going home? Billy smiled. I wanted to keep him that way, smiling at me across the open space with a moment of peace on his face. I left in a hurry. 
There was loud traffic and horns blaring at me as I zigzagged through the five o'clock rush of people heading home to their regular families. Dads in big cars coming home to see their kids and sit at the dinner table with the whole fam. I waved at people on the sidewalk and laughed when they stared at me, their faces covered with questions. I was glad they noticed me. At the Big G, I spent my $2 on their three burgers for a buck deal and then found an extra quarter in my pocket for a pop. Billy was waiting at the door when I returned, suddenly anxious. Here you go, chow down, I said, and I tossed him a bag of burgers. Then I saw his face. What's wrong, Billy? What is it? I have to go. He stood with his back against the wall, rubbing his hands up and down, his arms. What do you mean, right now? I have to go live with my mom in Oregon, don't I? We were just getting to be friends. Now I have to go. Billy looked sad again, like when he was talking about his dad dying. Yeah, just eat your damn burger, I said roughly, as I commandeered one of the burgers for myself. We can't do anything about anything, Billy, and you know it. At least you still got a mom. Good burger, he said, with his mouth full. Haven't eaten much, huh? Nope, believe it or not, candy bars can get kind of old, and I've read every one of those comics we had here a hundred times. You could have called. I wouldn't tell anybody. I know. I guess I'm an idiot. Takes one to know one. We laughed together, finally. It took a while after we ate to start the conversation again. So finally, I just stood up and said, come on, it's time to go. I could tell when he was ready. So we walked out into the sun and hopped on our bikes. As we rode away, I looked back at the Caribou Club and realized that when Billy told his story, and the police would want it all, the secret of our hangout would come out and maybe even be front page news. I just kept reminding myself that a friend like Billy was worth it. I was gonna leave him in his driveway to make up with his grandma on his own time. And when I turned to leave, he grabbed my arm. Hey, I was in the railroad yard, okay? I was hiding there and you found me cause I got scared and flagged you down. He talked fast, outlining our lie, and it had to be a big one. You mean, are you sure? I was nervous about telling yet another lie. Yeah, nothing about the club. We got it covered, man. You're the best liar I ever met, I said, as he walked his bike into the carport. He turned and smiled back at me. Takes one to know one. It was two days before Billy was allowed to call me and by then the cops had quizzed me and him both about finding him. This time there was no trip to the police station, just a phone call and then a drop by to clarify some details. I held pretty tight to my story and played up how excited I was to find Billy okay. When Billy called, he said we needed to apologize to Mr. Martin and he didn't feel like calling the other guys even though they had a lot more to answer for. We met later that day at Mr. Martin's driveway and I was feeling pretty meek and squeamish about the whole thing. He had been really nice to us and probably had us figured for class A jerks. When he answered the door, Mr. Martin looked us over and glared at us so I got hot and anxious. After an eternity, he said, well, look what we got here. I heard they rounded you up, Billy. I hope your grandma beat your ass for that stunt. What were you thinking, boy? Billy was all shaky and upset, but he stuck his chin out and met Mr. Martin's eye. I'm really sorry, Mr. Martin. I had no idea this would make trouble for you. You've been good to me and you had none of this coming. Yeah, I'm sorry too, I added, trying not to look away or down when I did it. Mr. Martin leaned on his door jam, a grin slowly sneaking across his face. Shoot, don't worry about me, boys. I've been danced around by the cops before and probably will be again. Relief flooded through me and I could see Billy relaxed. Mr. Martin continued, but your granny, there's a different story. You did a hard one on her boy and she'll be a while getting over it. Yeah, I know, sir. I really messed up. Now they're sending me to Oregon. I guess this is goodbye. He stuck out his hand to Mr. Martin who took it and gave it a good shake. All right, Billy, you keep your head screwed on, okay? And you, he looked at me, 
The cop said, you stood up for me. Thank you. Yes, sir. I said, but I'm sorry anyway. Okay, then I guess we're square. He held out his hand out to me and I shook it like a man. Billy and I were across the street heading home when he hollered. Hey, Sam, you want to shovel snow this winter? Earn a few bucks, you come on by. I'm getting old and lazy. Sure thing, Mr. Martin, that sounds good. We hopped on our bikes and rode to the Big G and ate Sundays together. We didn't talk much. There wasn't much left to say. Billy left for Oregon a couple days later. And that time in the Caribou Club, eating three for a buck burgers was our last time together. I figured he'd made new friends in Oregon since he was the kind of guy anybody would want for a pal. And I hoped someday he would get a nice Corvette Stingray to drive through life. On the way home, I tried to see ahead to the days between now and school. I was alone again, just like back in May. A homestead kid without friends in the big city. Well, that's the end of chapter 15, but it's not the end of Sam's story. Things are looking pretty bleak, but as they often are, it's always darkest before the dawn. Hopefully there's a bright dawn for Sam coming up in the next few chapters. Come back and see us again.